Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to start off by asking a pretty broad question. What is the most important thing that a military combat aircraft needs to be able to do? It's a question that really has no one specific answer, as it changes according to what kind of aircraft we're talking about. For fighters, your answer may be maneuverability or speed. For bombers, you may say bomb capacity or fuel load. For gunships, you may say cumulative firepower or range. There are a lot of variables, is my point here, but for the answer to the starting question, thinking broadly across all types of military attack aircraft, what do you need it to do? The answer, quite simply, is to be able to attack and use its weaponry. Otherwise, it's not much of a combat plane, is it? Now, I know this answer may be incredibly obvious. I mean, of course an attack aircraft needs to be able to attack. It's in the name, after all. But the subject for today's video actually struggled in this aspect. We're talking about a Soviet ground attack aircraft that couldn't actually attack. This is the Aleutian IL-40. The story of this double-barrel shotgun with wings starts in the early 1950s with Soviet aircraft designer Sergei Ilyushin. Up to this point, while testing and production on jet-powered aircraft was well underway, the Soviet arsenal of ground-attack aircraft was severely lacking behind. Their current stable of ground-attack aircraft consisted of any remaining IL-2 aircraft introduced in 1941, and the IL-10 introduced in 1944. Both of these were piston-engine prop planes that, while very good for their time, couldn't hold a candle to then-modern-day jet aircraft. Thus, an upgrade was desperately needed, so Sergei began design work on a new jet-powered ground attacker. Sergei would send in his initial design specs for the IL-40 in January 1952, where his design was quickly accepted and ordered into prototype production. The initial prototype, completed and flown on March 7, 1953, looked a little bit different than the final design in that it looked like a pretty standard jet aircraft, one that didn't really stand out design-wise. Powered by two McEwlin AM-5 turbojets located on either side of the fuselage at the wing roots, the general design of the IL-40 was akin to that of a high-speed dive bomber, combining the offensive and defensive weaponry typically seen on dive bombers with the design advancements seen on jet fighters. It would feature swept wings, common for jet aircraft, with added wing fences to counteract wingtip stalling. As the IL-40 was designed to be a ground attacker, it would need decent armor protection. The nose of the aircraft would need it in particular. A central shell between 3 and 8 millimeters thick contained the cockpit, six fuel tanks, and a good deal of the plane's electrical equipment. The pilot was given an extra 10 millimeters of armor to his front and another 8 millimeters on his headrest to protect against any fire from above or behind. The cockpit glass was also bulletproof, to what degree I do not know. There was also a rear-facing crew member that was provided an extra 4 to 10 millimeters of armor plating, and presumably he was given the bulletproof glass as well. The total weight of all of this armor by itself was nearly 2,000 kilos, or around 4,200 pounds, and the total empty weight of this plane would be around 18,700 pounds, or 8,500 kilos. Weaponry-wise, the IL-40 would be pretty basic, all things considered, but still pretty imposing for the time. The main guns would be six 23mm NR-23 autocannons in the nose, with three on either side of the nose. Each gun would be given 150 rounds of ammunition, and considering that the NR-23 fired at around 850 rounds a minute, if every gun were firing in unison, the IL-40 would expend all 900 of its 23mm rounds in just 10 and a half seconds. It would be like a massive shotgun blast, kind of fitting for what the plane ended up looking like. Regardless though, like so many dive bombers of the previous era, there would be a second crew member manning a single rear-facing NR-23, 
with around 200 rounds at his disposal. The plane would also be outfitted with four in-wing bomb bays and four wing hardpoints that could hold more bombs, bringing the total bomb load up to around 2,000 pounds or 900 kilos. These hardpoints could also be used for additional fuel tanks or even rockets. All in all, the IL-40 had a pretty solid arsenal. In its initial flight testing on March 7th, though, all of this weaponry didn't really matter as the prototype didn't even have them installed yet. They needed to see how the plane managed solely from a flight perspective, and these initial results were pretty successful. The only initial flaw of note was that the center of gravity was a little too far back, but this wasn't really an issue they had to be concerned with. The plane's biggest issue would only be revealed in a flight test at the end of March after the guns were installed. For one, the muzzle flash of the cannons was actually in the pilot's line of sight and was bright enough to temporarily blind him. If that wasn't bad enough, the pilot discovered that after firing the guns, the plane started to slow down. The plane wasn't just slowing down, but the engines had actually flamed out and weren't working properly. Luckily for the pilot in this test, he was able to get the engines working again, but this still presented a massive problem for the IL-40. If this ended up being a common occurrence, then the IL-40 was effectively an attack aircraft that couldn't attack, lest the engines be disabled. Additional tests were desperately needed, and the results were not good. Ground tests of the gun showed that the problem was not a simple anomaly, but rather something that would happen any time one of the guns was fired. The expelled gas from the guns would be sucked into the engine air intakes, causing them to sputter and flame out. If just one of the guns fired just a handful of rounds, it would make the engine sputter and fail. To fix this, the guns were completely reworked and slightly improved in the process. Out were the six NR-23 cannons, and in were four AM-23 cannons that fired about 50% faster than the NR-23. To compensate, each gun was given a 50% boost in ammo, up to 225 rounds per gun. Additionally, the guns were moved and installed in the very tip of the nose, and blast deflectors were installed that, in theory, would keep any expelled gases away from the engine air intakes. These new installations immediately had their own issue, where gas would accumulate with the spent rounds and it led to small explosions. Nothing catastrophic, mind you, but enough to warp the heat-resistant steel that the chamber was made of. This was rather easily solved, though, through some added ventilation. Now, as this engine issue had to be remedied no matter what, it ended up delaying the IL-40's testing by the Soviet Air Force by almost a year. Still, the IL-40 began state flight testing in early 1954, and the results were actually quite encouraging from a flight perspective. They found that the plane handled quite well, and when compared to the IL-10, it was faster, had a better rate of climb, had more firepower, had stronger weaponry, the IL-40 simply outclassed the IL-10 across the board. Additionally, the IL-40 was used in mock combat tests against the MiG-15 and MiG-17 fighters and actually held its own against them, despite not being designed for air-to-air -air combat. And yet, despite these successes, the whole gun engine problem actually remained, although it wasn't as bad as before. Now, the problem only surfaced when the guns were firing when the plane was in a side slip, as shown here. While this was certainly less of an issue, it still needed to be remedied, and Sergei decided to fix it with a rather unique double-barrel solution, and this new version of the IL-40 would be dubbed the IL-40P. With the engine air intakes now at the very front of the plane, the guns were moved under the fuselage behind the front wheel. Now, the gas from the guns couldn't possibly be taken into the engine air intakes, so the issue was solved, just in a rather strange-looking way. This change was made alongside several others. The engines would be upgraded in the meantime to an advanced version of the AM-5, 
called the RD-9V that brought the top speed up to 617 miles an hour. The bomb load would also be increased to around 3,100 pounds or 1,400 kilos, and the pilot was given a rearview mirror. No idea if he got one of those green air fresheners. The first flight test of this new model on February 14, 1955 was a complete success. All previous issues regarding engine flameout had been resolved, and as a result, the Soviet government placed an order for 40 IL-40Ps. However, a little over a year later, on April 13, 1956, after just five of the 40 had been made, production was ceased and the IL-40 program was abruptly cancelled. This cancellation, however, had basically nothing to do with the IL-40. Instead, it had more to do with a change in Soviet military doctrine as a whole. New military doctrine went away from using aircraft for close air support of ground troops, and instead they decided that they would use nuclear weaponry to fulfill that role. This was the Cold War, after all, and nukes were in vogue, so this move does make sense from that perspective. Also, it's not as if the U.S. wasn't also considering and testing small-scale tactical nuclear weapons. And normally, this would be where the story of the IL-40 would end. The military doctrine changed, it wasn't needed anymore, and the plane went away. However, the IL-40 would make a surprise appearance over a decade later in 1967. At that time, it seemed like the Soviet military changed their doctrine again and wanted to go back to using more conventional ground-attack aircraft. Obviously, a new technologically updated design was needed, and design requests went out to Soviet designers and manufacturers. Illusion decided to bring back the old IL-40 design and gave it some then-modern-day upgrades. Unfortunately for them, their design would be rejected in favor of the eventual winner, the Su-25, but Illusion decided to continue with the project regardless, and on September 25th, 1982, their prototype, now dubbed the IL-102, would fly for the first time. It would embark on hundreds of test flights before its engines finally gave out around two years later, and the project would be abandoned until eight years later in 1992, when the IL-102 made a surprise appearance at an air show in Moscow, with Illusion apparently trying to drum up interest for their design. There were no buyers, and the IL-102 project ended there. And with the end of the IL-102, thus officially ends the story of the IL-40, just a short 36 years after the project initially ended. In several regards, the IL-40 was a pretty fascinating plane. From not being able to use its weaponry, to being a double-barrel shotgun with wings, to then being unexpectedly revived after the initial project died. If the Soviets never altered their military doctrine and didn't remove the need for ground-attack planes, it's likely that the IL-40 would have enjoyed a pretty decent career. It flew well and was apparently well-liked by the pilots that flew it. The only thing that really would have held it back was the comparatively lackluster weaponry, at least when compared to later ground-attack aircraft. Still, it is likely that variants and upgrades would have been made, so I think if the Soviets didn't have that doctrine change, some variants of the IL-40 might have stuck around to this day. But in all honesty, who knows, I'm just making a bit of an educated guess. And with that, I think it's probably a good time to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Honestly, what I think they should have done was put the guns inside the double barrels. It would be intimidating, at the very least, and it would sort of fit it thematically. But they didn't, because they're no fun. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!